Hey, welcome back. How many of you were here last night and are just so excited to be here again? It's good, wonderful. I was at least paid to be here both times. You all are suckers. You gave money both times. So, but no, that's great. It's wonderful to be here. Hey, my name is Ryan and I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads Church. If you're a guest this morning, thank you so much for uh, being here, braving it. Uh, If this is your first time, I know walking into a church can be a very difficult journey. Uh, especially depending upon your history with this thing called religion. So thank you very much for that bravery and for being here today. Uh, We want to do our best to make you feel welcome and to know that you were invited by the divine to be here today and to experience unconditional love, radical inclusion, and the real heartbeat of what Jesus was all about. So that's why we are here. We're glad you're here. Uh, If you are new to Crossroads or if we've never been able to get together inside your program, there's a little note from me that welcomes you. Um, And my cell phone's in there. And I'd love to get together and have coffee with you, uh, an old-fashioned. Actually, I can't have old-fashions right now. I know, it's really sad, so I just have to drink it neat. So it's, uh, we all have our crosses to bear in life. So, but uh, I was able to do that. We got together with some folks this past week. So uh, just send me a text message. Love to do that. Have breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever, cocktail, and just hear your story, share a bit of my story, Crossroads story all that good stuff. Um, For those of you that are here today, and uh, a part of this month for you is Pride Month. We want to welcome you and celebrate with you and say we see you, and we are excited, and we we celebrate who you are, and as you are made in the image of God, and this is a place where you are fully welcomed, fully loved, fully invited to bring all of yourself uh, to here in leadership and to live out your truth, and so we're excited for that, and so happy Pride Month to you all as well. Last week, we launched our series. You can clap for that. You're all good. That's good. Um, Hey, last week we launched this brand new series that we're doing called Unacceptable Truth. And this is actually 301, what we're doing right now. So 101 is our kind of introduction to the peacemaking spirituality, rethinking, reimagining life of faith. It's called Fresh Perspective. 201 is called The Way of Peace. And it's kind of a real practical peacemaking rule of life. All this material is in our app and you're welcome to go through it at any time and to participate in a conversation group if you like. And right now we're introducing kind of three. 301, which is unacceptable truth, which really digs into the heartbeat, like what we're all about, what we want our spirituality, how we want it to exist in the world and change the world and bring peace into the world. So that's what we're doing. Last week was an introduction. Uh, so if you weren't able to be here and you got two or three hours on your hands, feel free to listen to that. How many of y'all say, amen, you were here last week, you know. You know, there were a lot of words, a lot of words last week. So, um, but that really does set up what we're going to be doing here over the next uh, six weeks this summer. And today, again, is kind of an introduction to this big idea of unacceptable truth. We've had a great weekend, and we've had a wonderful weekend with Jose and Marcy Palos from Restore LA, who have come to inspire us, to share with us their journey, what they're doing in their work, and how they're rewriting the unacceptable truths. And one thing I have loved in getting to know them because I didn't know them before they showed up here. And if I'm honest, I didn't want to know them because I didn't know them. See what I mean? But I want to know them now because I've gotten to know them and they're wonderful and they've got the heart of Jesus beating and, and it's just running through their veins. And they are doing some tremendous development work, rewriting the unacceptable truths in LA. And you'll hear more about that here in just a moment. But listen, they, a few years ago, they started this beautiful organization in partnership with their church called Restore LA that is looking to reach into the darkest corners, the spaces of the marginalized, the places where the hungry exist exist and for those that are are needing economic development. And what I love about the work of Restore LA, I love it, I love it, I love it, is that they're into the development business. And here's the thing. In our world, we often want to celebrate relief work because in relief work, you get to stand up and say, 20,000 people got fed today, but then they went home hungry and they had no idea how they were going to eat the next day. But we love those big numbers. But development work is difficult. It's hard work. It's expensive. It's exhausting. And so they are doing that work of 
economic development, transforming generations, generations. And that work is hard and it is slow. And sometimes you want to give up, but they are pressing in, doing amazing things there uh, with, and you'll hear more about it. It's wonderful. So make sure you check out their website, check it out there. When you give to Partners in Hope, that's what you're doing. You're giving to our partners like Restore LA. So thank you very much for doing that. So do me a favor, give a great big round of applause. And he sat in the far back so you could applaud very long because he's got to walk all the way up here. He knew what he was doing. That was no accident. This is a smart dude. Like, he knew it. He was like, I'm going to sit back here so you really have to applaud for the whole journey. He might even weave in and out, you know. So keep it coming. Keep it coming. Uh, By the way, while you're applauding, inside your program are the lyrics for the spoken word that Jose is going to perform here in just a moment. If you find, keep it coming. Keep it coming. I love it. I love it. I love this man. He's just, he knows what he needs to get going. He knows what he needs. Juice him up. Juice him up. You're crazy. You're crazy. Jose, thank you so much for being here today. Challenge us, encourage us, all that good stuff. (sighs) Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I feel like I can't say anything wrong after that. Well, trust me, you'll say less wrong than me. So. <laughs> exactly. So I feel, I feel good. Man, oh man, it has been a wonderful time here in Colorado. Um, I, we feel, my wife and I feel like Colorado, like uh, you guys are like cousins of California. It's just cool. I don't know what it is. Can't, you know, definitely not the altitude. There's definitely, we don't relate to that over there at sea level. I'll tell you what, I've been disordered. I feel like normal today. It took me like two, three days to acclimate. Been disoriented. I'm walking up like two, three steps. I'm like, oh, something wrong with me? I'm like, so worried. I'm worried. I'm like, because you know, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm turning 43, but there's things that start to kind of fall apart around this age. And just like, oh, wait, should I call my doctor? No, you're just in uh, Colorado. And so, uh, yeah, I'm just very happy to be here with you all. Um, we, we've met some new friends, and we've got to reunite with some old friends, and it's been wonderful. Um, and I decided to wear my hair down because I feel like if I look more like Jesus, you would listen to me a little more. You know? So I need, I need all the help I can get, so I did that for you guys. And, and it was interesting that we've been here for three days. It's, it's, feel, it's gone by so fast, but I had this message, and I feel like it changed like three, four different times. Where's Rollin? Rollin is responsible for that. Rollin, raise your hand. Rollin hit, hit me with a word yesterday. It was like the Holy Spirit just came upon this man, and he just spoke to me. I was like, whoa, I, I, need, to, I need to switch things up here a little bit. And he gave me some uh, valuable insight into Colorado itself, into Loveland, into Fort Collins, and... Um, and then I just started getting this sense of, like, Colorado is, is like this new frontier. It's a land of new frontier. I mean, yeah, you guys, and I think part of it is because you got all this wide open space. And I think about, like, man, people, people travel through this, like, with wagons, like, back in the day. Like, this is some treacherous ter- terrain here. And, um, but I think this message that I want to bring to you today um, has to, has to uh, deal with a little bit about that new frontier uh, when it comes to our faith and spirituality and how we have the opportunities to pioneer something, something new, something that we envision, something that I think is not for the faint of heart and something that is not for people who want to continue clinging on to old ways, old mindsets, old patterns, old habits that we might have picked up along the way, maybe through church, if you grew up in church and um, different things like that. And so, but I'm going to start off with the poem. I'm, I'm a little better of a poet than I am of a preacher, so you're going to get the good stuff here, all right? Uh, and this poem is changing. You guys have some handouts there, so you guys can follow along. You guys Ready? Can I get a little a volume, a little lower, please? Thank you. Check, check. It's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. This jungle makes me wonder how my spirit hasn't failed yet. Humanity hanging in the balance. The rich stay well fed. 
Well, those who claim they got answers, they have them well kept. I know the gates of hell can't prevail because me and hell met. People running and screaming, skies falling, wearing helmets. Social media warriors looking at their posts like, yeah, I nailed it. Doped on that dopamine from all the folks who agree with you commenting that was well said. While the real war is loving our neighbor, we think is hell bent. The real war takes place in our soul. Some ain't been there yet. The real war is holding space and being present with others who don't have the privilege of catching their breath yet. You see, injustice is all around, and that's getting pretty old. What people don't know is that change comes from within the soul. So we only have ourselves to blame when that change comes really slow. And they're shooting up malls and white neighborhoods now, but hey, here we go. Got past 40% off. Say a prayer for our pitied souls. Really, though, fire trapped up in these bones to fuel prayer for mamas and papas of prosper so we can see them getting old. So they sit in the rockers telling us about the family no longer here because they got shot up, caught up. Happens all too often in the cities where we roam. So I went to the wilderness and I met this raven on a hill. He told me, boy, chill with all that faith talk. He would harass me and had the audacity to tell me, prayer doesn't change a thing. In fact, real prayer should change you. He told me, if you're going to complain about the scenery, then at least go out and change the view. But of course... We feel the power when we're crowded in the steeple, shouting for hours with our people, saved and sanctified in these hours that are evil, feeling love as deep as the ocean while others drowning in the seashore, having stewarded our vision, yet we're asking God to see more. Less courage outside, though, unless religious pride deceive you, Especially because we read how in the Bible there's a sequel to save us from all the things that make us so frightened and so fearful. Last time I checked, divinity had no part in exclusivity because love is a power for the people. But all that love talk turns foul like some fecal as soon as someone with an opposing view simply just wants to shake your hand and greet you. In the proximity of vulnerability too close for some. To stomach. You see, real change isn't so grandiose. More than not, it takes place where there's no media content to post, to humble brag or boast. Most of the times, it's just a lot of little hard steps in the direction of trying to love and serve as many souls as humanly possible. Hardly free from conflict. As we continue to persevere through a diversity of adversity on the road filled with many losses, but one that invites us to turn those L's into lessons, to create a catalyst for change, contrived out of disappointment and pain. But will we now function and live from a multiverse of blessings, tangibly manifesting God in essence, when we interact, integrate, Engage, intertwine, and remember that we are one. So I lift up my heart full of gratitude. I raise my glass and declare a toast to the gracious ghosts, opening minds and hearts, lighting up the dark and not to see through the fog of funky and flawed human filters and strive from freedom from political propaganda, promoting slander through the ether where hearts are a bullseye on a target. Because we don't battle against flesh and blood. But the measure of change is always determined by how well did we love. Thank you. Let me just set this over here. Knock that down. All right. That was a lot. So you got your little uh, handouts there. You guys can go and... um, Read that later and catch up with all the words that just were spewed at you. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Jose Paulus, 43 years old, been married for 13 years to so my wonderful wife, Marcella Paulus, sitting, is sitting in the back over there. She's my, she's my backbone. She's my ride or die. Couldn't have done this trip without her. Um, we have two beautiful kids, uh, eight and 11-year-old Enoch and Penny. 
And we have uh, three pets. We've got a fancy leopard gecko, an English bulldog, and a, and a cat named Lima. She, uh, you guys laugh at the cat, right? Because you know the cat, they run stuff. They're like, they're strange animals. They're like, they're like aliens and like furry bodies. They're, they're interesting. And, you know, my wife has been in ministry for nearly two decades. She's a second generation uh, minister, PK and all that. I didn't grow up in the church. I grew up quite opposite. My life was so polarized. Uh, you know, my parents divorced when I was a, a baby. Um, and they married my, my, their, their first, um, first marriage, no, their second marriages. They married the most complete opposite people to, to the other Right, so my stepmom was a DEA agent, and my stepdad, he was a drug dealer. <laughs> in fact, my dad, my stepdad served, uh, you know, five years in, in state penitentiary in uh, Chino, California, and it was actually one of her colleagues that set up the sting operation. So talk about dysfunction, right? Uh, and then I, then, and then I, then I got saved, and I stepped into church. And talk about a whole nother set of dysfunction, right? <laughs> Some of you guys are not laughing. Come on, dude. This, y'all know it's, it's, it's rough. It's rough. You've been any, in any amount of time in church, you go through some stuff. It's, it's some weird stuff. I tell my wife all the time, I said, man, you know what? I lived a pretty hard life, but I wouldn't change it for the life that you lived as a PK. Because it's different. It is different. It's a different world. And that's what I came to talk to you about this morning um, I came to talk to you about, yes, the fact that I feel like Colorado is a new frontier for so many opportunities, a new representation of God, uh, a new representation of the kingdom, a new representation of what a community of faith sh should look like, should act like, should live like together. I really believe that. I really believe for those of you who want to uh, receive it, I think it's a prophetic declaration that I'm making today that Colorado and this, this whole region of the United States is a new frontier. And I feel like God is looking for pioneers to step in and answer the calling of what he wants to do here on earth. So the passage I'm going to read from today is Jeremiah 29, 4 through 7. And uh, this is from the message translation. Are you? I heard. It's the mic. It's my hair. It's the Jesus locks. It's on this side. Yeah, there we go. All right. Good. I'm sorry about that. I should have had the handheld. Okay, Jeremiah 29. This is the message from the God of the angel armies, Israel's God, to all the exiles I've taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses. Make yourselves at home, put in gardens, and eat what grows in that country. Marry and have children. Encourage your children to marry and have children so that you'll thrive in that country and not waste away. Make yourselves at home there and work for the country's welfare. Pray for Babylon's well-being. If things go well for Babylon, things go well for you. Amen. God, I just pray that you would help me. Communicate a message. Communicate your heart. And let us leave here emboldened and confident, calm, resting in your reality and your love to do and be great for you. Just trust in you, really, at the end of the day. Amen. This chunk of scripture has fascinated me for the last five years since the pandemic and seen, in my opinion, the church's sad reaction to society and culture. Heartbreaking, I would say. Heartbreaking reaction. Not all of us, but a grand portion of us. The way that we've reacted when we've been presented opportunities to stand by communities of color who were dying literally before our eyes in unjust ways. 
And I couldn't understand that some of us would even go so far as to double down and act as if there is no injustice and there is no racism and everything is fine. And in fact, we should actually go back in time where things were even better. And that, that would be great. That's, that, that's you know, and, and, and I, couldn't, I couldn't understand. And I'm like, why? Why, why, why? And people would get mad at us. People would get mad at us. Oh, why are you guys so, so liberal? Why, 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 why are you like that? Why are you, you, why are you? And, we're, and, and a lot of times, in fact, people would be upset at us because we stood up. We were, we were vocal, as many of you were as well, um, about a lot of the injustices that you saw come out during that time. But only a couple people would ask me why. And the people that I would ask them, they wouldn't really have anything to say afterwards. And I would tell them, I said, look, we, we, serve, we serve a community Back in Restore LA, people that we serve are 70% undocumented, right? These people are the tapestry of Los Angeles. How many people have had the privilege of going to Los Angeles? Yeah, how many don't want to ever go to Los Angeles, right? Yeah, I feel you, bro. I understand. That's why I'm here getting some reprieve, you know what I mean, some rest, because it's crazy over there. Got to go back. But if, if, if you guys know, we've been to Los Angeles, it's pretty diverse, and what a lot of people don't know is that it, it doesn't matter where you're at. If you're going to eat sushi, Korean barbecue, uh, Joe's barbecue, fried chicken, um, ramen, it doesn't matter. You're going to see some Latino brother in the back chopping it up, cooking it up, throwing the sashimi on your plate, and it's going to be the most delicious thing ever. The same thing with, you know, building homes. They build homes. They, they are the tapestry of our society. They're taking care of your kids. They're making your clothes. And so we live in a whole different reality than most people are used to. And at the, at, at the end, I came to an understanding, like, you really can't fault them. But that was our reality. And, and I started seeing that people were reacting uh, to the, the present circumstance of, of um, you know, people of color, any person that is marginalized, now getting a little bit of, of light in the sense that people are starting to support these marginalized communities. And there are a group of people in this country and in the world who do not like that because all of a sudden, they start to feel what it's like to be marginalized. They start to feel what it's like, right, to, to maybe even they start realizing that they're a part of the problem. And they don't want to accept that. And it's difficult. And so that's why I feel like this passage of Scripture is, is, is so profound to me because it's a prophetic picture to me of uh, our, our nation. And especially Christians in this nation. So according to the Bible, Israel was blessed by God to be a blessing to the nations. They lost sight of that and became so comfortable with the blessing and security that they became exclusive and forgot the mission. So their exclusivity, in their, exclu in their exclusivity, they became something that God never intended for them to be. And what stands out to me in this passage of Scripture is the last thing on Israel's mind was to go into captivity to un under Babylon for 70 years. They were so confident that God was going to free them and liberate them and go ahead and keep on blessing them. And that's the last thing that they expected was 70 years. Do you know how many generations that is? That means that some of us are going to die here. It's a hard reality to accept for them. But I feel like in our age, the last thing on many Christians' mind is the idea that we, they would continue to live in, live in a world that they can no longer relate to. One that continues to evolve into something so foreign that it feels like captivity. It feels like captivity, the fact that, you know, we, we're, we're now way more loving and accepting of gays, of the LGBTQIA community, right? Way more... Uh, uh, speaking up about black lives mattering, about immigrant lives mattering, about Arabic Muslim lives mattering, right? 
They, they can't fathom like, man, we're living in a whole different world. And religious mindsets, viewing God and the world, limit us from serving and loving an ever-evolving and changing world. It becomes so foreign to us that the desire to be raptured or for God to bring judgment becomes more prevalent than wanting to serve and love. And so a lot of us, we're like in this, you know, waiting for, and I think a lot of it is, is conditioning. I'm going to be quite honest with you. I think a lot of it probably was rooted in good intentions, and then all of a sudden, you know, it started attached to us in some funky ways that God's like, oh my gosh, this is not, this is not my point. This is not what I, what I intended for my people. And so we, we find communities of faith doubling down in weird ways, in strange ways, in ways that like me, even other people of faith are like, oh, what the heck is going on here? You know, whatever happened to the kumbaya, whatever happened to the love, whatever happened to, you know, this is getting kind of weird. And what the, what the interesting thing is that God said, he says, he says to Israel, he says, you know what? He says, your blessing is going to be dependent on the blessing of your captives. Now, how's that for a ringer? You already got 70 years of punishment. You know, when you get punished by, you get sent to your room by your parents. Yeah, I'm already here. And, 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 then, and then it's like if they're asking you to, like, if, if you got in a fight with your brother and sister and they were at fault, right? Now you got to make them happy. And, and you getting out of this room is going to be dependent on them being happy. Like, that's crazy. It's just crazy. But I do think that this was something more practical than spiritual. I think that whenever we decide to hold back blessings, whenever we decide to hold back love, whenever we decide to hold back forgiveness, joy from others, we are harboring the opposite. We are most likely not loving ourselves. We are most likely not compassionate to ourselves. We are most likely holding on to some bitterness, some forgiveness, some grudges. And it becomes, it becomes very difficult at that stage to experience God's blessing, which in this passage, it's, it's one of the times that um, the Bible introduces this idea of shalom, of completeness, of wholeness, psychologically, emotionally, physically, societal, cultural, wholeness, where everything, everyone has enough. And we're in a time where there is so much angst, there's so much, I don't know, I, I want to I wanna see, I wonder if there's any research on how many ulcers have, uh, people have developed in the last five years. You know what I'm saying? Like how, many, how, like how much gastrointestinal uh, issues that people have had just from all the frustration, just from all the anger, just from all the hatred, just from all that, Right? And that's why I'm saying I think that this is just more than just like spiritual. Like I know that there's some spiritual components to this, but this is quite practical. It's physical. When we, put our, when we put ourselves against the people that God has called us to love, we are harming ourselves. And I think a deeper truth that some are not willing to accept is that the, re the reason that is is because... We are more connected than we give ourselves credit than we're, more, than we're conscious of. Right? God said, I am in you. I am in my Father. You are in me. Right? You and me, I and you. and We're one. You know, God, God is so diverse that it takes every human being on the face of the earth that has ever existed to begin to reflect the image of God. Right? Amen. I mean, whatever. And, and, but it draws us back to the point that we are one. And so in order for us, even the people that are like doubling down on, you know, whatever it is, if it's religious freedom or whatever righteous, holy expectation standard that, that, that they have, it is, it's still important. It's still important. To exercise, to love as you want to be loved. It's still important. That's the only way to progress in society. 
That's, the, that's it. That's the only way. In L.A., uh, you know, now that we work in community development, we work with all sorts of different types of people. And I love it. I, I absolutely love it. I love, I love like, when like, people of non-faith, like when they check you. I love that. It's refreshing. It's so refreshing because it's so real. It's so real, and it aligns you, and it corrects you, gets you right back into like, oh, snap, okay, like, let me, let me come correct. And it's always a reminder, especially because, like, for me, like, in church, all the time that I spent in, in church, church was my work, play, my community, it was everything. I didn't have a lot of friends that were outside of church. And when I started... When I, after the pandemic, my wife and I started this community development corporation where we were focusing on affordable housing, focusing on small business. So in, in a sense, God was kind of saying, all right, like, this is what you guys got to do. You guys got to, you know, build homes, plant vineyards, give you, you know, celebrate culture, integrate yourself into society. And we find ourselves surrounded Surrounded by so many opportunities to love, to see people grow. People that will never be in our pews. People that would never come to our church. Well, we love them unconditionally. And it's been one of the most fulfilling times of my whole life. And the fact that I get to do it with my wife is even better. For those of us that feel a little more awakened and more progressive, for those of us a little feel more a little educated, we've been reading the right books, we're listening to the right people, we're, we're, we're uh, deconstructing, decolonizing, whatever you want to, you know, unplugging, whatever you want to call it, the posture is always going to be humility because too much is given, much is required, right? The book of James said, let a holy life be shown by good works. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life and doing good works with humility that comes from wisdom. Proverbs 23, 3 through 4 says, wise people are builders. They build families. They build businesses. They build communities. And through intelligence and insight, their enterprises are established and endure. Because of their skilled le leadership, the hearts of people are filled with the treasures of wisdom and the pleasures of spiritual wealth. And it's all about love. It really is. But as you see in a, in a clip, uh, you know, in, in a couple moments, uh, it's, it's, real love isn't really popular. Real love isn't really popular, man. Like, it's very easy. Like Jesus said, like, what, what do you gain if you love, like, the people that love you? You know? What does it look like to, people, to love people that hate you? You know? What does it look like to hold space and... and, and uh, and create a space of peace and love and belonging to people that, like, they look at you and they're just, like, every trigger is triggered and they're ready to just blow your head off. Like, like you know, what does it look like? What does it look like? What does love look like in that case? Rumi says, love is the bridge between you and everything. Love is the bridge between you and everything. So during our time here in Colorado, it's been really cool, to be honest. Um, you guys have some amazing leaders in this community of faith with uh, Ryan and Wendy. They, they're pioneers. In this new frontier, they are pioneers. Because in a lot of ways, they've already paid the, they already paid the price. And that's what you got to do in this, in this new age. You got you to gotta, you gotta get lost. You got to go out into the world and get lost. To be salt and light, you got to go out there. You just do. And you guys are in good hands. But you're presented with an opportunity. You're presented with an opportunity to believe generationally. To look into the future and to dare to believe that, you know what? My nation's... Best days are not behind them. It's not behind us. Amen? Man, 
Because how many of us are proud to be in this country, proud, of born, uh, proud to be born here, right, and have a legacy attached to it? You know, some of you, many, many generations. I'm a first gen. My parents come from, from Mexico. But I love, I'm a Mexican-American. I love being from this country. I'm so proud. I'm so thankful to be part of this country. But it is really sad to think that, man, the, the be- really the best is behind us? You, you know it wasn't that long ago that women could have vote, right? Right? You know it was only a couple hundred years ago where, where, where black people weren't even considered uh, fully human, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, where we're at now compared to where we were, I think there's a lot of great things in our favor. There's a lot of jacks, jacked up stuff. Yes, there's a lot of horrible stuff. It's very messy. Very messy out there. But I believe that God is calling us. God is calling us to dare to believe, to envision what this region could look like. You know, what, you know all due respect, you know why people, you got, y'all going to be the minorities eventually, right? Because... <laughs> Because I, I know, because I, I know the same thing with, with Latinos. Latinos, they, they like, they like, you know, they like white girls. They like, you know, white boys. And, you know, they like the blonde hair and the blue eyes. You know, opposites attract. And that's how it is. We're going to have such a mixture, such, such a, a, you know, just a, a melting pot in, in the next, just in the few generations to come. Here, here in this place, we have all this wide open space. There's no more space in L.A. Literally, we're building up, you know. But here you got all this wide open space in, in, in community, filled with communities, with people with great values, great heart, warmth, kindness, welcoming. That's what we've experienced here during our time here, almost every place that we've been to. And so you all have the opportunity to usher in uh, a, a new representation, a fresh representation of God and start creating communities that celebrate diversity, that bring in shalom, that are inclusive, that bring healing, that create space for people to feel loved, to feel empowered, to feel emboldened, to be like, you know, I feel seen. I don't feel missed. I don't feel like they miss me. I feel like when they see me, they actually see who I am. And, and that makes me feel me. That makes me feel like I am. I am a child of God. I am created in God's image. That, that my life is okay. My lifestyle is perfectly fine. And I am loved the way that I am. Amen. Dang, it takes me like to yell and raise my voice to get you guys. Okay. Next time I'm going to just come in. I was reserved because I, I don't know if you guys are used to people. I know Ryan can raise his voice a little bit, but I'm Mexican, man. I'll go freaking out. <laughs> Especially when anointing hit, man. Woo! But it takes courage. It's, it's hard. And we're going to mess up. And we're going to have to apologize. And we're going to have to ask for forgiveness, and we're going to have to ask for clarity and understanding and to learn and to, and to unlearn and to develop new mindsets. But if we're willing, if we just are just a little bit willing, I think God takes that. He runs with it. He re- I think God runs with it. I'm, I'm stalling because I feel like there was one more thing I wanted to share here, but I think, I, I think I'm done. Um, <laughs> I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being so warm and welcoming. Um, I know a lot of you have been here for a long time, but don't take, don't take this place for granted. This part of the country where you're at in this time and place in history, it's very pivotal. Very pivotal. I feel God all over it, and I want to encourage you all that you will be responsible for ushering, ushering in a, a right, right expression, a beautiful expression of God, a whole expression of God. Y'all will be responsible for bringing shalom. All right. I'm going to leave you with a clip from one of my favorite authors, writers, activists, James Baldwin. A lot of you probably know him. And um, he's going to close it out. He's going to close it out. He's going to talk about love. And uh, thank you for your time. And uh, we'll be around if anybody wants to talk. 
uh, after the service. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. There may not be uh, much land in the world that we'd like to see, but there is some. There's more than one would think. In any case, if you, if you break faith with what you know, that's a betrayal of many, 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 many people. I may know six people, but that's enough. Love has never been a popular movement. And no one's ever wanted really to be free. The world is held together, really it is held together. By the love and the passion of very few people. Otherwise, of course you can despair. Walk down the street of any city, any afternoon, and look around you. What you gotta remember is what you're looking at is also you. Everyone you're looking at is also you. You could be that person. You could be that monster. You could be that cop. And you have to decide on yourself not to be.